tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. And become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 15. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. We have a particularly grisly and rather excellent little tale for you all to sink your teeth into this evening from Horror Hill newcomer J.R. Park, and I'm pretty sure this one will leave an impression. Quick warning, this one gets a little intense, and if you happen to be someone highly sensitive to violence against animals in fiction, well... This is your trigger warning. All right, glad that's out of the way. Shall we? You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now... Without further ado, from author J.R. Park, I give you The Ugly. The image was silent. Despite the television being muted, cries of pain still found a way to set Haley's teeth on edge. The contortion of the cat's face, the madness of fear in its eyes, both left no doubt as to the terror that cut through its core. Haley's empathy caused her stomach to swirl, churning her lunch into an unwelcome discomfort as she held her head in her hands. Forcing herself to look on, she despaired at the scenes that played out before her. The poor animal struggled to escape from its tormentors, but was held firm by a young girl who pinned the feline against a wooden fence. Fighting against the resistance of the creature, the girl held out one of the cat's paws and splayed its toes wide, giving her brother a bigger target as he lined up a crooked nail against the creature's soft, delicate pad. The hammer struck its target, driving the nail into the animal's skin and through its paw, burying the point deep into the wooden panel behind. 
Blood poured down the fence as the cat arched its back in agony and curled its tail, convulsing in pain. It tried to fight back, clawing and hissing at its attackers, but could do nothing to prevent the girl from holding out another paw and once again splaying the soft, delicate toes. The boy took a second nail and placed it over the squirming animal's limb, jabbing it into the leathery pad like a golfer setting up their tee. Bringing his hammer back and steadying himself, he swung it forward, connecting with the nail and forcing it through the creature's flesh. His hammer caught the paw, crushing the bones inside and splitting its skin. An eruption of blood splattered the two children, and although the CCTV camera had filmed them from behind, the side profile of their lifting cheeks and shaking shoulders were a clear signal of the grins and mirth that dominated their faces. The image flickered and Haley hoped it would end, but the visuals regained clarity, detailing the cat in monochrome night vision as it hung on the fence crucified by its abhorrent tormentors. The girl prized a nail from her brother's fist and pushed it into the animal's stomach. Drawing it up toward the cat's throat, she slowly forced the skin apart, digging her fingers in once she had worked a large enough wound and tearing at the animal's fur. Greedily, her brother barged her to one side and forced his hands into the widening hole sliding his fingers through the gore-drenched gash and pulling at the feline's flesh. The cat's strength began to weaken as its attempts to fight against its torturous restraints became too painful to bear, but still, it continued to hiss and wail, screeching as it flashed its fangs at its juvenile attackers. Haley felt her stomach flip as she watched the children force handfuls of fur-lined meat into their mouths chewing on the chunks they'd torn from the helpless pet. They fought like feeding sharks as it jostled for position in front of the feast, wildly grabbing at the hanging flesh and pulling its insides out. The slopping sound was only in her mind, but she heard it clear enough when the animal's entrails began slipping from the growing wound, dangling like flesh-filled streamers from the panic staccato of its beating chest. Her palms were moist, her head spun with the revulsion that gripped her tightening stomach. She could feel the trembling in her hands. How much more of this could she take? At last, the children turned to the camera, their mouths full, Blood dripping down their long, pointed chins as they heartily chewed on the screaming animal's meat. Even with the low resolution of the CCTV recording, Haley could make out their strange features. Those long, slender noses, large ears, and high, rounded cheeks. Making them look like caricatures found on Toby jugs, or adorning the cover of Mad Magazine. Enough she said, causing her boss to pause the recording. It's definitely those two, all right. That's Evan and Lenka. She stared at the screen, the two impish faces smiling with devilish delight as they stared back at her on the flickering monitor, their eyes full of evil. Haley took a sip of coffee and composed herself. The haunting images of the video ran through her mind. It had been three days since the police had brought the CCTV recording to the office, and two days since her boss had shown her the shocking footage. Getting the appointment arranged had been a tennis match of text messages with the foster parents, but the children were waiting outside, patiently and promptly this morning, when Haley drove by to pick them up. For some reason, she had known it would be Lenka and Eben, even before she sat down to watch the tape. She'd taken pity on them when they'd first been sent to her, as she did to all kids in need. It's why she took the job as a social worker. But, despite this sympathy, despite her ingrained desire to help, from the first moment she met them, she couldn't shake the feeling there was something wrong with them. Something that sent a chill through her body, 
and set her nerves on edge whenever she was in their company. It wasn't a good notion for a social worker to entertain, but she couldn't change the way she felt. Haley tried to override this feeling of unease with her usual compassion, but her gut instincts proved willfully stronger and resisted any fight with reason. Relief was more welcome than usual when the pair quickly found a place in foster care. Dawn and Lee Hayes were a good, wholesome couple that didn't seem to feel the same cloying dread as Haley had whilst alone in the pair's presence. But with the video footage captured from the city's CCTV, her hunch had been proved right. It was with dismay but urgency that the children were called in for an interview and psychiatric assessment, and as Haley took another sip from her coffee, hoping its usual satisfaction would grant a little respite, she could still feel the beady, unblinking eyes of Lenka and Eben, watching her with a fixed gaze across the desk. The gloom of an overcast day had penetrated the building, seeping through the windows, and no amount of playing with the light control seemed to shift the shadows that settled in the room. With flashes from the video replaying in her thoughts, of teeth gnawing on feline flesh, the social worker gulped back the lukewarm brown liquid and quietly longed for the calming drag of a cigarette. Did you know that you were hurting the cat? Haley asked, trying hard to keep her voice from quivering with disgust. Disgust and fear. Yes, Evan answered matter-of-factly without a trace of remorse. The most possible hurt we could, Lanka followed up, her expression unchanging and her focus fixed on the woman questioning them. Haley felt the rising pimples of goose flesh spread across her arm. She thought back to the blood-splattered smile she'd watched on the CCTV, their stares managing to pierce her soul, even through the barrier of a television screen. Today was no different, only even more disturbing in the flesh. They were a strange case, taken off the streets three weeks ago by the police and handed to social services. No one knew about the CCTV at the time, That took a while to surface and do the rounds, from head teachers to parent groups, and finally, to Haley's place of work. They had nothing on file for the two children, no birth certificates, no immigration papers or asylum documentation. It was possible they could have snuck into the country, stowed away in a lorry to get through border control. But with who? And from where? Did you mean to kill the cat? She asked, unnerved by their calmness. Eventually, Lanka replied, her single word answer left to hang in the preceding silence. Both Lanka and Eben had a clipped accent, but not one that helped pinpoint their country of origin. The children knew very little about their own history, at least very little they were willing to impart. The pair were a mystery. Picking up a crayon and running it along one of the blank pieces of paper that had been left out for them, Lanka filled in the lingering silence. We didn't want it to die straight away. Not until we got to feed. Evan gave her a glancing look, but his sister continued. It needed to be alive whilst we ate its meat. It needed to scream. Haley swallowed back the saliva in her throat hoping to dampen the nausea that swirled within her. I like to chew on the eyes. Lanka's grin grew wider as she put the crayon down and stared at the social worker. Her white teeth glowed in the gloom as the light spread across her face, like a cold, calculated threat. They taste like sugar knobs. Slides down your throat with a wondrous taste, Eben added. Haley felt herself shrink into the chair. The grotesque confessions of these children and their startling detachment was overwhelming, sending the woman's head into a spin. Her heart thumped against her ribs and her palms grew uncomfortably moist. What? <clears throat> Why did you do it? Mampi, Lanka said offhandedly, 
as her attention returned back to the crayon and her own scribblings. He, Lenka, Evan called her name through gritted teeth, closing her down before she could say any more. It's okay, Evan, Haley reassured him. You're safe here. She was in over her head, but she fought her disgust and continued with the questioning, determined to find out more. Pussycats don't deserve to be treated that way. I just want to know why you did it. Who is Mampy? It'll be okay. She paused for a moment. I promise. Mampy helped us, Evan acquiesced, his eyes boring deep into hers. He taught us to survive. Did he tell you to eat the cat? For food? For protection, came Evan's response. His ski jump nose wrinkled and his brow furrowed. His grin, fixed and devoid of any joy, curled at the edges, betraying an emotional response. But when Haley failed to decipher, Protection? she asked. Against what? You said we're safe here? Uncertainty turned Eben's statement into a question. Blanca stopped coloring and looked up expectantly at the social worker, quietly humming an annoyingly catchy tune. Haley wasn't sure what it was, but the two had been whistling the same melody on and off since she'd picked them up. The off-key rendition grated at the social worker's ears. The wavering notes felt like fingernails through her brain. Of course you're safe. No one's going to hurt you, Haley reassured him, commanding a compassionate smile from her lips. Whatever happened in your past is long gone. You're with us now. We're here to protect you. We shouldn't talk about it, Evan's voice lowered to barely a whisper. We don't mention his name. Who? Came the adult's measured response. You can tell me. Lenka stopped humming and stared at her brother. The pair didn't utter a word, but a look of agreement fell upon their faces as they concluded their unspoken communication. It haunts us. Haunts us. Levin confessed. Winter is coming. It's why we're here. Lenka's hushed voice was barely audible. We are running out of places to hide. Haley leaned forward and attempted to reach out, to hold their hands in a sign of solidarity, but something made her stop, her subconscious screaming inside, reacting to the clawing dread that lurked in the back of her mind. Who is after you? She asked softly. Eben leaned in closer, his head almost touching hers. His voice shook as it cracked with fear forcing the words from his mouth like a globule of phlegm he was too disgusted to let slide past his tongue. When he finally found the courage, he uttered two words. The Ugly. Inhaling deeply on a cigarette, Haley tried to steady her shaking hand. The wind was refreshing as it blew against her, howling through the alleyway beside her place of work. The day had started off badly. Confronting her son over accusations of bullying from his school had led to a stand-up row, one that resulted in Billy calling her a fucking bitch. Enraged by this outburst, she struck him across the face, an open palm slap that was designed to shock more than hurt. It shocked them both. The strike had been so instinctive so reactionary that the first thing she knew about it was the tingling in her hand and the red mark across his cheek. Haley had spent all day berating herself. She'd never hurt her child, but the anger of hearing her polite young son talk like an eight-year-old thought was just too much to bear. It wasn't really Billy's fault. He was impressionable, easily led. He'd fallen in with the wrong crowd, His older cousins would steer him right, she had no doubt. And that language. Where did he learn to swear like that? The answer was obvious. Ken, her husband, allowed Billy to stay up late when they were home alone, and together they watched action movies. That was going to stop. 
My young mind was a sponge, easily swayed by attitudes and actions in films and television, easily polluted by what passed as adult entertainment. The kid stuff was bad enough. Everything was so dramatic, upfront, and violent. Had her actions, her lashing out on her son, been driven by the saturation of the modern culture? Had she been influenced by the aggression that was present even in things as innocuous as soap operas and television commercials? Advertising creatives have become finely attuned at producing something that would resonate and persuade. Subliminal messaging was illegal, but if done well, how would anyone know? The bombardment was constant from television, the internet, billboards, everywhere you went. Their promotions would be pushed, the products bought. But what of the side effects? She inhaled deeply, listening to the burning cherry of her cigarette crackle. Disbelief and rage. A red glow from the impact of her palm. Billy's upset face had never been far from her mind. His angry expression haunting her all day. Trying to clear it from her mind, she prayed things would settle down and he'd forgive her when they both got back home later this evening. Guilt had permeated her thoughts, saturating her consciousness. She was better than that. They both were. This afternoon's nerve-shredding confrontation with Eben and Lanka was the icing on the cake. Haley was out of her depth. She needed to bring in a professional psychologist. Allowing a moment to concentrate on the exhale of smoke, she studied her phone for the twentieth time in as many minutes, but there was still no response from the foster parents. There was no use ringing them. Lee never carried a phone with him, and after taking early retirement, spent most of his time in his shed. Dawn was deaf, but kept her phone glued to her side. Haley had already sent her a text, but still, no reply. Mampi taught us how to hide. The words from the interview still dominated her thoughts. The scenes of the uncomfortable conversation replaying in her mind. Who is the ugly? Haley stiffened in her chair. Not who. What? Lenka answered, still fixated on her drawing. The ugliest darkness. It is all the evil you've ever known made into a man. It's as tall as this room and has shoulders that would barely fit through the door. It's fat and sweaty and wheezes like it's ill. Haley leaned across the desk and studied the young girl's grotesque picture. Are you drawing him now? Yes, Lanka replied. That's his mouth. It droops and rests on his chest because it's too big for his face. It doesn't smile like we do. Not that it's ever really happy. The only happiness it knows comes from the misery of others. You can't see any teeth. Not yet, anyway. When it gets you, its mouth opens up like an umbrella and sucks you in. That's when you see teeth. That's when it traps you, halfway in, peeling back your skin, making you more naked than you've ever been. The word she used seemed carefully chosen, like she was repeating a story, recounting a tale that had been told to her by someone much older. It takes hours for the beast to finish you off. Trying to ignore the chilling tone in the little girl's voice, Haley moved closer to the picture and pointed to its face. She felt the presence of someone behind her, a feeling that she was being watched. Where, where are its eyes? She asked. They're here. Lanka pointed below its furrowed brow. They are small, like little shriveled currants, and they don't work too good. But it hears okay, and smells really well with its purple nose. That's how it tracks us. Eben, trying to shake the feeling from her shoulder as Haley offered the girl's brother a chance to speak. He took it up willingly eager to show his knowledge and prove himself better than his sibling. She's kind of right, but she's got his belly all wrong. The ugly is much fatter than her picture. 
and it's always hungry. It has a scruffy beard and yellow fingernails that scratch when they catch you. The woman's skin itched as if preparing to be touched by something unpleasant, something hovering just behind her, something foul. What does he want? Why is he after you? She asked, trying to probe to understand what awful truth lay behind this dark imagining. We escaped its lair, Lanka answered, drawing a dark circle behind the image, leaving Haley unsure if the girl was drawing a pit or an entrance to a cave. Sweat seeped from Haley's pores, causing her clothes to cling uncomfortably to her body. She wanted to arch her neck, to turn around and reassure herself that nothing was there, but refused to give in to such unfounded and ridiculous fears. When our parents died, we had no one to protect us, Evan expanded. The villagers threw us to the ugly, leaving us stranded in its lair. They thought if it had us, it would leave their own children alone, Haley shuddered, breaking her adult composure as the influence of their story crawled through her. Mampi saved us, Evan continued. He rescued us took us away from the monster and away from the village. When the ugly found out, it was furious we'd escaped. And once having set eyes on him, we were never safe again. Lanka stopped drawing again and looked at Haley with an expressionless face. But Mampi taught us how to hide, how to keep the ugly at bay. At bay. An unusual choice of expression for a child. The social worker noted, trying her hardest to keep herself grounded in professionalism. It likes the smell of children. The taste of us. Evan stared deep into her eyes. We can sour the taste. Pollute our systems if we eat the flesh of the screaming. The more they scream, the more they suffer. The longer it lasts the longer we can hide. Make them scream so we don't have to, Lanka chipped in. And where is he now? Haley felt another chill creep down her spine, like the sinister tickle of a galloping spider. The ugly? Eben asked. Yes, yes, the ugly. He's close, the small boy replied bawling his hands tightly into fists, making his knuckles turn white. Winter's coming. Don't get caught, Lanka warned before leaning back on her chair, causing it to creak. The sound set Haley's teeth on edge. She glanced between the two, eyeing the pair up. Who was leading whom? Between siblings, there was usually one more willful than the other, one that led the way. One that might carry the delusion stronger. Separating them could help the weaker of the two be free of this nightmarish delusion. But who was it? Evan and Lanka seemed to be on equal footing, at times speaking like they were one person. Neither's influence seemed bigger than the other's. You mentioned your village. Where you came from. Where is that? Haley's questions were forced from a drying throat. Home, came the unhelpful response. Is it far away? We'll never go back. Evan shuffled in his seat. Haley's head began to pound. And what about Mampy? He's not with us, Evan stated, showing the first hint of remorse since the interview began. Lanka bowed her head and scanned the veneer of the desktop, unsure of where to put her gaze. The children were currently in the playroom, enjoying warmer surroundings than her office. It gave her time to think. She threw her cigarette on the floor and trod on the glowing ember, twisting her heel to ensure it was extinguished. Heading back in through a fire escape and walking towards the reception, she checked in on the children, gave them a smile, and told them she wouldn't be long. Briefing the receptionist to keep an eye on the pair, Haley checked her phone again as she stepped into her car. 
She needed to speak with Dawn and Lee. Had their foster parents learned any more details that might help piece this dark mystery together? Haley shuddered at the possibilities as she turned the key, firing the ignition. The still house was of no surprise when she arrived, but the lack of barking when she knocked on the door worried her. Monty was normally first to announce a visitor, his black paws up on the sofa as he barked at the window, or bounding round the side with an eager excitement, showing the Labrador's young age. Heading to the back of the old farmhouse, she stopped to peer through a window, but was unable to see past the reflections on the glass and into the darkened interior. Haley breathed in the fresh country air. Their home was situated on an old piece of farmland. It was less than a couple of miles from the city, but it felt like a world apart. The open green fields, the peace and quiet. She coveted the tranquility. Even on a day as miserable as this, it was a veritable paradise. The kind of place she'd love to raise her billy. The Hazes were foster parents that were certainly well-suited and equipped to give unfortunate children a better life. She was glad they had registered, passed the checks, and were willing to take on Eben and Lenka. It could be so hard to place older children, especially a brother and sister. Taking them both meant they didn't have to be separated. There was no doubt they'd be treated with love and affection. But did Dawn and Lee know anything about the eerie confession she had borne witness to earlier? Had the Hazes unintentionally gleaned information about Eben and Lanka's past? Had they heard stories that hinted at the dark truths, taking them as nothing more than childish fantasies? She didn't imagine for one moment that the children had been cast out as sacrificial lambs to a supernatural demon... But monsters did exist. They were real, lurking on internet chat rooms and hanging by school gates. The scraggly beard, the yellowing fingers, the big bloated belly all pointed towards some kind of social misfit. And what else did the children say about the ugly? It likes the smell of children and taste of us. Haley grew cold at the thought, making you more naked than you've ever been. Her teeth clenched as she tried not to think about it. It takes hours for the beast to finish you off. Her stomach tightened, a mixture of rage and disgust. Its mouth opens up like an umbrella and sucks you in. Bile stung her throat. It was no wonder the children had built up a fantasy to protect themselves from the vile truth, to create a world of demons for such evil to lurk. But this fantasy had done more than shield them from the awful truth of the world. It had made them dangerous, projecting their own rage outward and onto something they could harm. It had turned them into killers. The image of a cat's stripped flesh flashed through her mind. Violence begat violence. It was a vicious cycle, and one that needed to be stopped. The poor children. So angry. So vulnerable. So confused. She thought of her own son, Billy, only a little younger than Lanka and Eben. What she wouldn't have done to hug him right then, to know he was safe. The back garden was empty as she made her way round the side, so was the shed. Approaching the house, she checked her phone once more. Nothing. Hello? She nervously called as she gently knocked on the back door. When her greeting was met with silence, Haley turned the door handle. Finding it unlocked, she gently pushed it open and stepped inside. The kitchen's strip light hummed as its harsh illumination fought back the brooding darkness of the building storm outside. Empty cereal bowls sat on the counter with remnants of dried cornflakes clinging to their rims. A fly buzzed through the air, 
making jagged circles with its haphazard flight path. Lost maggots crawled through the rotten mulch that lined a neglected dog bowl. Haley choked on the smell. Mr. Hayes? Still no answer. Dawn? Lee? It's, uh, it's Haley Patterson. Dirty marks ran across the hallway carpet as she headed further into the house, blotting the otherwise pristine cream shag pile. Following the trail, her nose curled at the strange, unpleasant odor. It was more than rotten dog food. The unidentified stench grew stronger as she followed the trail along the floor. Her ears picked out a murmur, the low hum of a television. She recognized the theme tune to the children's channel, then the increased audio of a commercial break. Her heart pushed into her throat. Her breath labored in fright at odds with the cheery jingle for kids' cold medicine. Turning a corner, Haley entered the dining room and froze. Her face twisted with terror, and after a few moments, her fear-addled brain finally accepted what she saw. Fishing her mobile phone from her handbag, she slowly walked backwards as trembling hands searched the keypad. Sprawled across the table with a pen driven into the soft flesh of his neck, Lee's eyes were nothing more than deep, dark craters as his blood-covered shirt lay ripped open, revealing a stomach that had been torn in two, then pulled to pieces. Hello, Ken? Haley screamed into her Bluetooth as she sped back to the office. If you're there, just please, please, please pick up. I, I want to speak to Billy. I just, I just... I just want to know he's okay. Hands tied to a chair and head slumping forward, Dawn's hair obscured part of her face. The cheek that was visible basked in the sunshine that shone through the window, illuminating the flies that had already started to collect around her ravaged remains. Skin hung, torn and ragged, from the bite marks that made her face almost unrecognizable. Her fingertips, nothing more than stumps, shredded to the bone. Haley beat her fists against the steering wheel as she slowed in traffic. Tears streamed down her cheeks as the sights of the Hayes dining room continued to flash through her mind. Their dog, swinging from the door handle by its own lead, its eyes pulled out, its mouth taped up with six-inch nails driven through its snout, its back peeled and flesh dug out leaving a sanguine crater carved out by small hands. Haley honked at her horn, frustrated at the gridlocked traffic and the radio announcement of an accident up ahead. The sky grumbled above her as the clouds grew darker. She rolled up her window, protecting herself from the sudden onslaught of rain. It was an irrational thing to do, to call her husband and check on her son. But after witnessing death's gruesome aftermath, after feeling it breathe down the nape of her neck, the first thing that came to Haley's mind was the safety of her own family. Their argument this morning dissolved into a meaningless charade, a stupid set-to between mother and son. She didn't care if he swore. She just wanted his forgiveness and love. She wanted to hold him, and know he was safe. He wasn't a bully. It was just a childish phase, something he would grow out of. Billy would never be like Eben and Lanka. They were dangerous. The influence of their traumatic past had deeply affected them, creating monsters to mask the real evil that hid behind the face of humanity. But their delusions had gone too far. Abused or not, they were killing and torturing, and they had to be stopped. The police had to be called, but they hadn't taken her warning seriously. The threat of murderous children was treated as nothing more than the ravings of a madwoman, 
hysteria brought on by the discovery of mutilated corpses. The operator had instructed Haley to calm down, but there was no time to lose. Leaving the murder scene, she allowed the approaching police officer to find the tiny, blood-smeared handprints that covered the walls in their own time. They could come to their own conclusions about the child-sized teeth marks that ravaged the dead bodies, about why all the victims' eyes had been gouged from their sockets, about the gore-soaked graffiti written with the aid of a torn-off dog leg and splattered against the wallpaper the foot-high letters that dribbled down the walls. Two words. The ugly. Rushing through the entrance, Haley stopped for a moment and caught her breath. The traffic accident had held her up for the best part of an hour, making matters worse when her phone ran out of power before she could call through to the office. All that nervous checking throughout the day had taken its toll on the battery. Straightening her suit jacket, she poured a glass of water from the cooler, regained her composure, and forced a smile at the front desk. Your son's here, Mrs. Patterson, the receptionist beamed as she closed her computer down and slipped on her coat. My son? Haley asked, confused. That's right. Mr. Patterson came by and dropped him off. Her smile never faltered behind the thick red lip gloss. He said he got your message, but couldn't get through when he called back. He had a job to attend and wasn't expecting you to be working so late, so he brought your son here. Oh, then, uh, where is he now? Mr. Patterson waited around for ten minutes, but had to leave for the job. Don't worry, really safe and sound. I put him in the playroom with Lanka and Eben. Haley's heart thudded against her ribcage. Are you okay to lock up? The receptionist asked, quickly checking her phone and smiling at the contents of a text message. Everyone else is gone, but I stayed to keep an eye on the kids until you arrived. Oh, um, would you mind hanging back a little bit longer, please, Anne? I'm sorry, her smile growing wider. I have a hot date tonight. Fireman, square jaw and beautiful blue eyes. Mm, I don't want to be late. You have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Haley said, forcing the disingenuous sentiment before walking down the empty corridors toward the playroom, stopping at the kitchen to pick up a knife. Gingerly, Haley pushed open the door to the playroom, hearing the sound of laughter coming to an abrupt and guilty silence. The cartoon sounds of explosions and pratfalls from the television did nothing to fill the uncomfortable silence as Billy smiled, watching his mom cautiously enter the room. Lanka and Eben stood to either side of him, each holding a hand. Their unflinching smiles turned to face his mother with a sinister intensity. Hey, Mommy! Meet my new friends, Eben and Lanka! They're really funny! He exclaimed excitedly. We've had so much fun! I've met them before, Billy. The fake smile failed to hide the concern that creased her face. They know so many stories. Don't listen to them, honey. You remember what we said this morning? You can be so easily led. His face tightened at the mention of their previous altercation. The door shut behind her, clicking closed and making her jump. Quickly, she countered her instinctive correction towards her son with genuine concern. How are you, darling? Are you okay? Now was not the time to bring up the argument. I'm fine. His tone was peppered with resentment. Billy, she called gently but firmly. Billy, I want you to come here. It's time to go. He looked at his new friends who squeezed their grip tighter on his hands. Oh, can't I stay a little longer? He asked, turning back to his mom. No, it's home time. Haley held her free hand out, motioning to take his. Come on, Billy. Her other hand clenched the handle of her weapon tightly, keeping it concealed behind her back. Can Lanka and Eben come? No, not today. Eben and Lanka have to stay here. They need to talk to Mommy and her friends. The young boy looked toward his newfound companions, 
They said nothing, but pulled his hands closer to them. Their grins grew wider. I don't want to go, Billy said, although his defiant tone had softened the gentle as she spoke. Come on, Billy, she cooed, stepping closer. Looking back at the brother and sister, he slowly and reluctantly let go of their hands. Gripping his mother's palm, he allowed her to guide him close to her side. Did they hurt you? She said, keeping her gaze fixed on Lenka and Eben. Mom, they're nice. They want to help me. Did you do it? She eyed the pair, her voice trembling. Did you... Did you kill your foster parents? She's been to the house. Lenka turned to Eben. I told you we shouldn't have come here. I knew it was a bad idea, he protested. Why did you kill them? Haley felt her hand shake. We told you, Lenka half sang. We had no choice, Eben explained. The effects of the cat wore off, the girl continued, their sentences flowing between each other as if spoken from the same person. The ugly was closing in. We were scared. We did the only thing we knew how. The boy stepped closer to the social worker, his eyes brightening with a joyful memory. We ate their flesh. Slowly. Over the course of a week. They suffered for seven days. Lanka laughed and followed her brother's cue, edging closer to the social worker. Keep away, Haley warned as she edged backwards, feeling the handle of the closed door push into her spine. Their torment served us well. Eben ignored her threat, his grin widening. They screamed so hard their flesh kept us concealed for days. But we were trapped on the farm, Lenka added, and the ugly was closing in once more. When you texted to arrange the appointment, Eben carried on. You gave us an opportunity to escape. Rain wrapped against the window, like a thousand small hands knocking on the glass. The interruption startled the children. It's here. Eben's voice was shrill with panic. The ugly's coming. We don't have much time. You told us we'd be okay. Lanka cried in anguish towards the social worker. That you'd protect us. You said we'd be safe. There's nothing coming, Haley told them. There is no ugly. Not the way you think. A loud bang reverberated around the building. She's just like the rest. I knew I shouldn't have listened to you. I said she couldn't be trusted. Eben cried. It's coming. And there's nothing she can do about it. It's not my fault, Lenka argued back. Yes, it is. You convinced me to reply to her text. You convinced me that we'd be better off with her. He pushed his sister with short jabs to the shoulders as he shouted into her face. It's been circling since we arrived, and all we've done is sit here. Mampy said, to hell with Mampy. Haley studied their confused faces. They were terrified beyond belief. Her heart began to melt. Yes, they performed awful acts, but they didn't know what they did. Their innocence had been corrupted, but it was not beyond redemption. They needed help, not punishment. This morning, she'd slapped her son. This evening, she'd held a knife, ready to strike out at a pair of orphans. What had she become? Dropping the blade, Haley placed her arms around the two. Stunned by her touch, the children paused for a moment, taking in her compassionate smile before collapsing into her embrace amid a flood of tears. Pulling them closer, she gently rubbed their backs. Her neck grew wet from their grief as they buried their faces into her warm skin. It's okay, she whispered softly. It's going to be okay. Behind her, Haley heard the television, 
The irritating theme of the children's channel came to an end, followed by a commercial. Its heightened volume piercing through her soft words of comfort. Are you feeling unwell? Wheezy? Cough? Runny nose? Pasty skin? Chapped lips? Try Mampy's magic cold formula. The embrace relaxed as the social worker turned to the TV. Mampy? Wasn't that... With one sip, it'll slide down your throat with a wondrous taste, making the pain go away. On the screen was the cartoon image of a large man, overweight and bleary-eyed. He wheezed and coughed with the symptoms of a cold. Unkempt and unwashed, he struggled to keep his eyes open as he stroked his unshaven chin. It'll get to work straight away, sending those pesky germs into a panic. The children were watching, transfixed on the grotesque image of the unwell man. Their eyes were glazed, the shadows from the room dancing in their pupils. Kill those germs. Make them scream so you don't have to. Pasty skin, chapped lips, red nose. Their lips moved in sync, mouthing the words. Keep the lurgy at bay. Winter's coming. Don't get caught. Listen to Mampy. With a new, improved recipe. It tastes just like sugar knobs. A jingle signaled the end of the commercial. A chorus of xylophone chimes and piano stabs accompanying a sickeningly sweet yet familiar melody. One she'd heard Lenka and Eben hum throughout the day. Mampy knows best... Mampy knows right. Keep the lurgy at bay. It'll serve them right. The children sang along, their words differing slightly. Mampy knows best. Mampy knows right. Keep the ugly at bay. It'll serve them right. The lurgy. The ugly. Was this the ugly? A commercial? A cartoon caricature? A misheard lyric? Had the atrocities they'd faced made them so raw that it had warped and twisted their impressionable minds? Alone, with no one to guide them, these protective dark fantasies had grown, mutated, festered. The poor dears. Without warning, Haley felt a blow against her side as Lenka struck her in the stomach. A bang as her head hit the wall, pushed to the floor by the brother and sister. A searing pain arched across her stomach as the blade tore through her torso. Eben stood above her with the dripping weapon held aloft. Haley tried to stand, but a slash across her thigh brought her crashing back down. She yelped with pain as she clutched her gushing injuries her slippery fingers failing to stem the crimson flow. A cold gust swept through the room, and something shifted within her peripheral vision. Something dark. Something big. Oh, it couldn't be. Please, Haley begged, trying to force words out to her agony. You don't need to do this. A slice across her face caught her lips, turning her speech into a blood-curdling shriek. A shriek that echoed around the deserted building. Make her suffer, Lanka laughed as her hungry eyes regarded the defenseless woman. Make her scream so we don't have to. No! screamed Billy, running towards Eben and taking the knife from his hand. Tears of relief streamed down Haley's cheeks as she dared a half-smile. I want to do it, he demanded, turning towards his mother. Her eyes widened as she watched her son slowly step towards her. Lanka and Eben whooped with delight. That's right, Billy. It's the only way to be safe. He'll get you too. We have to hide. Make her scream! Eben hollered ecstatically. Keep the ugly at bay! His words echoed the advertisement. Haley tried to stand, but a mixture of pain and shock held her pinned. 
The sinister smile of her son loomed near as the knife tip waved centimeters from her face. For a moment, his eyes were glazed, the shadows from the room dancing in his pupils. The commercial had him too. Mampy knows best. Mampy knows right. Keep the ugly at bay. It'll serve them right. The melody floated through the air, carried by the lips of the eight-year-old audience. Eben and Lenka love me. They want to keep me safe from the ugly. Billy spat his words with venom. You just want to shout at me. To hit me. His face grew red with anger as he dragged the point across her cheek. Even if she was able, how could she fight against her own child? Winter's coming, don't get caught. He recounted the commercial as he scored into her skin. Billy, Haley tried to say, but terror made her mute. She wanted to tell him that it was just a commercial, a grisly, stupid advertisement. She wanted to tell him that she loved him, that she had felt so bad about striking him this morning. But all she could do was scream as she felt the blade slide deep into her eye socket. Gouge it out, gouge it out, gouge it out, gouge it out, gouge it out. The murderous duo egged him on. Mampy knows best. Mampy knows right. Keep the ugly at bay. It'll serve them right. Pain seared through her body as he pulled at her eyeball, cutting away at the surrounding skin. Wrenching at the optic cord, he sliced through the meaty membrane and licked his lips. Chew on it. It'll slide down your throat with a wondrous taste, Lenka called. A reciting of the commercial made effervescent with sickly anticipation. Mmm, mmm, Billy exclaimed as he burst the juicy orb between his teeth. It tastes... Just like sugar knobs. You've been listening to The Ugly by author J.R. Park. J.R. Park is a writer of horror fiction based in Bristol, United Kingdom, and co founder of the publishing imprint The Sinister Horror Company. His novels have all been well received by readers and reviewers even if the sick bucket hasn't been too far away from their bedsides. Art house, pulp, and exploitation alike inform his inspirations, as well as misheard conversations, partially remembered childhood terrors, and cheese before sleep. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in.
You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill, unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tone considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, You'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling tales for dark nights.